is what what is the amount of free carbonyl or free amino groups etc which determine the ph obviously the ph can be controlled by the choice of the raw material that is plant varieties animal tissues etc different types of material they have their own specific ph so by either you select the raw material or even sometime have the appropriate blending of the raw material or sometimes certain chemicals etc may also be added to get the desired ph in the ingredient for processing and ultimately desired ph in the end product okay. and second approach can be that as i told you by the addition or in situ formation of acidic or alkali low molecular weight compounds that are either these are certain preservatives that is which control ph of the food certain chemicals acids or salts as the case may be either they are added from outside or there is a, they are encouraged conditions are created for in situ production of acidic or alkaline compounds like in the case of fermented foods pickles etc what happened many times okay so the growth of microorganism <clears throat> may be inhibited or is inhibited by both lower ph as well as higher ph okay like majority of the pathogenic microorganisms which cause diseases they require optimum ph near neutral so they near neutral are in the slightly low acid food so if you lower down the acidity below a certain level that is <coughs> go to the ph lower side or increase the acidity lower the ph so even below 4.5 or even you can go for 3.7 many times the foods are classified on the basis of ph so that is most of the pathogenic bacteria will not be able to grow if the ph is reduced below 4.5 even if it is further reduced below 3.7 etc the other that even almost all bacteria will not grow and only the some acid tolerant yeast and molds can grow so these are the however there are a few commodities like for example egg that they are still edible at ph 9 that is most of the food that we eat they are either low acid or near neutral or sometime acid food high acid food like also citrus juices etc but there are very few that which are alkaline food even whole egg is a, it's a, it is a, a low acid food or slightly neutral food but if you see the egg white or egg Hello. So, egg white, it has a pH of nine, and it uh, permits the growth of. That is the only one example exception which the permits the growth of microorganism at such high pH, pH nine. Otherwise, that above eight or so, you can say most of the microorganisms are not able to grow or multiply. That side, upper side, you can say in general eight, and lower side. you can take in general that is four so this so four to eight or 7.5 that might be the range of the ph which supports the growth of various okay so the organic acids they are used as a food preservative they are important in food preservation so <clears throat> let me briefly tell how these <clears throat> organic acids act the, what is the effect of organic acid on microorganism so it will effect of organic acid and microorganism depends depends on two factors one is their dissociation constant and the other that the ability of their undissociated forms to penetrate in the cytoplasmic membrane that is number one that is what is the dissociation constant of the organic acid that how easily easily it can be dissociated number one number two that how much this undissociated form of the organic acid like benzoic acid citric acid and such other <coughs> sorbic acid all these acids which are propionic acid which are defined as a preservative all right so they are the main Uh, thing is that that their undissociated form should be able to 
penetrate into the they should be able to penetrate into the cytoplasmic membrane in their undissociated part so some organic acid that they told you like sarbic acid benzoic acid propionic acid etc <coughs> act virtually by the latter mechanism that it did enter the cell membrane in undissociated form and they disturb the ph homeostasis inside the cell right and that's why that they uh, and the ph homeostasis inside the cell is disturbed those cellular reactions etc are also uh, accordingly affected and the growth of microorganism finally ceases so such organic acids are classified as preservative in food legislation not all organic acid are not all acids etc can be categorized in as a food preservative only those organic acids which are able to penetrate into the cell membrane in their undissociated form they are now the i told you the minimum ph for growth as well as the rate of inactivation of microorganism by acids is therefore affected by the nature of acidulent that is acid which is uh, what is its nature earlier uh, seen dissociation constant etc then also the presence of other inhibitory factors like low water activity preservatives low temperature that may interfere with the energy metabolism or increase the need for maintenance energy etc so the presence of other factors and finally that the ability of the microorganism to react to acid stress and to maintain the ph homeostasis either by active homeostasis or passive homeostasis because what happens when this acid penetrate into the cell homeostasis is disturbed then the cell try to there is so a, some stress is created so cell try to uh, that uh, cope up with resist fight that stress and in the process sometimes they lose their maintenance they need more maintenance energy or right, they they lose the energy of metabolism or finally the growth stops and the cell which is able to for the how much it is able to fight that stress it will be able to survive so active and passive homeostasis in passive homeostasis ph homeostasis microorganism either prevent external protons from entering the cell or increase the buffering capacity of their cytoplasm by synthesis of glutamate or other compounds like citrates etc that is which balances the ph or nullifies the effect of the stress in the active ph homeostasis cell maintain their cytoplasmic ph through metabolic activity regularly their organelle metabolic activity they try to maintain the ph so that is here but only important thing is that that if the cell is by the time up to which time the cell is able to maintain its homeostasis ph homeostasis it will its uh, genetic process growth etc will be there otherwise if it is not able to fight that its growth will stop okay so this was briefly about the ph next now let us see the control of water activity okay so of all the factors affecting microbial growth death and survival in food the influence of water activity on vegetative microorganisms and spores has been one of the most importantly and most widely studied factors can anyone say someone will summarize what is water activity basically how do you, what do you understand by water activity hello sir the deterioration of the food due to the unborn water molecules in the food uh, that is the free water which is available in the bio material food material which is available for the chemical reactions which is available for the microbiological growth etc microbiological reaction enzymatic process etc so you can say that unbound water is rightly or or free water available in the that determines the water activity it is not actually the total water content 
वाटर कंटेंट में भी वेरी हाई बट इट मे बी प्रेजेंट इन द बाउंड फॉर्म इन साइड द सेल इट मे नॉट बी अवेलेबल फॉर द रिएक्शन टू कटलाइज द केमिकल रिएक्शन फॉर माइक्रोबियल ग्रोथ एक्सेट्रा सो दैट वाटर विच इज फ्री इट गिव्स इट्स वाटर एक्टिविटी राइट एंड इन अदर वर्ड्स यू कैन से दैट देर आर रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ वाटर एक्टिविटी दैट इज इक्विब्रियम रिलेटिव ह्यूमिडिटी ऑफ द फूड एक्सप्रेस्ड इन डेसिमल इज बिकम्स वाटर एक्टिविटी सो वाटर एक्टिविटी ऑफ प्योर वाटर विच इज फाउंड इन completely free form water is water uh, sea water or distilled water you can say that will be one and when there is any salt dissolved in it there is some depression maybe some water activity lowering down etc there so that uh, optimum majority of the microorganism they are able to freely grow and multiply in a food which has Water activity in the range of 0.99 to 0.98. Okay, so that is very highly liquid food or highly hydrated food. That is which has free our water available in plenty in their cellular matrix, etc. Which has high water activity, maybe 0.98 to 0.99. Then majority of the microorganisms find it favorable for their growth. Okay, however. there are microorganism there are various microorganism every microorganism has limiting a value below which it will not grow it will not form a spore or it will not produce toxic metabolites in the user this 0.99 to 0.98 is the general requirement almost all microorganism but if you lower down so certain group of bacteria or certain group of microorganism will not be able to grow for example common spoilage bacteria are inhibited at an aw of about 0.96 means what does it mean that if you lower down the water activity of food to 0.96 so the majority of the are common spoilage bacteria will not be able to grow in that food pathogenic bacteria there is disease causing bacteria they are little bit more tolerant to water activity than the spoilage bacteria and if we have a comparison between a few strains like clostridial strain bacillus or staphylococcus aureus is, which are the poisonic or pathogenic microorganisms so clostridium like clostridium botulinum or such other species uh, Uh, bacteria of clostridial species they will grow further lower that is 0.94 so if you lower down water activity below 0.94 this uh, even this pathogenic bacteria clostridium will not be able to grow below 9.93 bacillus species will not be able to grow staphylococcus aureus okay which is that uh, is the most tolerant pathogen and it can grow in aerobic environment where the free oxygen is available it can grow in a uh, food which has a water activity as low as 0.80 and in anaerobic environment it can grow only in 0.91 okay so this is about you can say the most of the bacteria so if you say that 0.75 2.85 that is you bring 0.85 far below that is 0.86 is the lowest can say for the most of the pathogenic and non pathogenic so if the acidity of the sorry water activity of the food is brought below 0.85 so it will be rather uh, most of these microorganism is spoilage as well as pathogenic they will be taken care of they will not be able to grow and in fact and this fact that is the 0.75 to 0.85 water activity is taken at the range of intermediate moisture activity or imf food most of the food leathers which you get even jelly etc that is the food contains that is high water but its water activity is depressed and brought into the range of 0.75 to 0.85 so that the texture etc of the food is good but at the same time it doesn't support the growth of 
microorganisms is spoilage as well as pathogenic microorganisms so that becomes intermediate moisture food imf which is we call so that is about the bacteria if you see the yeast and molds they are little more dry loving they can uh, uh, manage to grow in dry conditions that they are probably able to proliferate at a uh, water activity below 0.85 while some asmophilic and xerophilic molds are capable of slow growth at just above 0.6 so the take away point here is that if you lower down now the water activity up to 0.6 so that food it will take care of all the microorganisms related problems however below this there might be some chemicals etc chemical reactions may be catalyzed there are like lipid oxidation etc they uh, uh, take place at a very very low water activity but and the, that's uh, so preserve a food by using only reduction of water activity as a stress factor a should be a water activity should be brought to uh, lower down to point uh, 0.6 so this will make the food microorganism free microorganism it will not support the growth and multiplication of the microorganism of course that food has to be properly packaged and other conditions are to be taken care of and if you go little further further below because below this some uh, chemical reactions may be oxidative reactions and other reactions may be there so even it is a water activity is further brought down to a monolayer moisture content level m0 if you have any idea of gave question etc so there m0 is there means that is m0 is the amount of water which is a, if you see that jarson isotherm there is a sigmoidal so first lower and then it goes higher so this at lower side it is normally at a range of about water activity 0.2 to 0.3 means if you bring down the food make the food uh, its water activity may be 0.2 to 0.3 in that range so food will become room temperature is stable that is lower down the water activity to its monolayer moisture content means that is at that monolayer moisture content is the water which is the present but it is not it is not available for any sort of reactions chemical reactions microbial reactions enzymatic reactions etc so that is the things but of course uh, this controlling this when you are lowering down the moisture content appropriate method has to be uh, taken uh, used otherwise only food technology what very simple because you are when you are lowering down the dehydrating the food its a sensory characteristics its textural profile and other eating quality etc has to be kept intact or even the so appropriate methods should be used to control the water activity so that water activity is brought down but its eating quality is not adversely affected its rehydration characteristics are intact okay so the fully dehydrated food that i told you for instance that, that have a, about 0.3 in order to control not only microbial growth but physical chemical and biochemical reactions deleterious reactions to color texture flavor nutritive value etc okay so that is but one thing important thing which you should know that minimum water activity for growth is always equal or lower than the minimum water activity for toxin production minimum water activity for growth is always lower okay, than the minimum water activity for trans so it will grow and then only it will produce toxin okay major advances in the control of water activity as a means of food preservation however will be contingent upon the improvement of food sensory aspects as i told you resulting from lowering of the water activity and the refinement of the techniques of controlling water activity so water activity in the food of a food can be controlled by either removing the part of the free water 
from the food by using appropriate dehydration technologies or alternatively adding appropriate amounts of amounts and types of salt sugar or such other water binding agents in the food okay that is which can bind them so either or even some of the methods both are used that is a part of the water is removed can be removed and a part of the these water binding agents chemical food grade chemicals etc can be added so this is a brief about the principles of food preservation technologies now we will take up at least one by one some important process principles does anyone has any query or question up to this point yes any any query no Shruti Mahalakshmi. Hello, Shruti. Shruti Mahalakshmi. Ariel. Not there. Anyway, so if there is no query, let us start now. As I told you, we will be taking now one by one sub uh, processing. So first we will take preservation or processing of food by addition of heat or in other words thermal processing of the food is it clear can will someone confirm that yes you are able to see the new slides yes sir, yes, sir. okay it is visible i am audible all right so let's move ahead so what is i think thermal processing that is you know that thermally processed food they constitute a large part of the food preservation industry today and these most of the majority of the thermal processes are highly mechanized there are food industries large scale food industries which process the food with the help of with the principles of addition of heat and these are all many times highly mechanized and well controlled process okay even it is the process which is used in our home as popular that is in the catering establishment and in home for the making the food eatable edible so various thermal processes which are applied to food it can be categorized like cooking blanching pasteurization and sterilization there is the purposes for which Uh, the heat is given to food or foods are heated it may be to cook the food to blanch the food to pasteurize the food or to us uh, sterilize the food okay so now let's briefly what are the objectives and what we do in this cooking where well, you know all that that agricultural materials are biological materials which is a food raw material in the farm in which it is grown okay it may not be edible we cannot eat Plus, without cooking, cannot eat even that many uh, like uh, grain, paddy, paddy, wheat, etc. Without further processing them, or many of these raw materials, they their components in the farm which they are present in the they are not digestible. They are having many a time some undesirable components, etc. So that uh, the cooking is done the heating process and his the primary major objective major purpose of the cooking is to produce a more palatable food the food is more palatable it is good in its sensory characteristics it is good in its eating qualities and of course we have to see that as when we are cooking that while improving its palatability it should not result in the uh, nutritional loss or other components all right so the important preservation changes that take into the food during cooking it may be destruction or reduction of microorganisms inactivation of microorganism okay because you are applying the heat so these 
uh, spoilage causing factors or deteriorating factors like biological factors like microorganisms and enzymes, they may be inactivated, they may be uh, destroyed. So food, even cooked food, that's why it may become a little bit more stable than their natural counterpart, uncooked counterpart. They will, okay. However, if the cooking process is not properly controlled, as I told you, there might it might lead into undesirable changes like destruction of sensory quality. That is, it may cause burning of the food. Okay, flavor, etc. Everything, flavor, color. You see that when overcooking is done in a, even in our home, what happens? You can feel it easily. So there may be it may result into the destruction of sensory quality, or and degradation of nutritional value. So. In addition to these preservation changes or undesirable changes, there may also be some changes in the food depending upon the type of the food and amount of the heat that is given, form in which the heat is given, etc. It may result to the destruction of toxin sometimes. There is some toxin already produced in food by microbes. There are many toxins are heat labile, so they get deactivated, destroyed during cooking. There may be destruction of color, flavor, texture, as I told you, or that is more important change that takes place is the improvement in the digestibility of the food constituent or their biological value, that is the form that is in which or if this food is assimilated properly in the in the body, etc. All those things can be improved. These are the so these are the various changes. So these are the changes that take place in the food during cooking. Now they are in the cooking is applied. There are normally six forms of cooking in which it can be applied. Like that you can see that. Uh, Okay, six forms of cooking, only the baking, broiling, roasting, boiling, steaming, and frying. Okay, so the top three, baking, broiling, and roasting, these three are mostly dry heat processes. Dry heat processes, that the heat is given dry environment, okay, and they invariably, many times, more than 100 degrees Celsius temperature is used, sometimes even 150, 200, depending upon, so that baking, baking is done, it is a dry heat, uh, right, even bread, etc., baked at, at a temperature of 200, 205 degrees Celsius, biscuits, etc., maybe even further high, 230, 40 degrees Celsius, so that is done. Broiling, broil is the, to directly cook over coal, etc., that is the direct on the flame, the food is broiled, chicken, etc. is very popular. So that is the broiling and roasting, of course. That is, it may be dry heat treatment given the material in the roaster size that's sand roasting. Some heating medium may be sand, salt, etc. may be used, but it is a dry heat. Then the, uh, the other two, boiling and steaming. These are wet heating methods where either uh, boiling, in water, or even uh, that is steam may be used for boiling. Okay, but it is normally here the temperature is around 100 degrees Celsius. These are the wet heating process, boiling and steaming, and the temperature is around 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, steaming is some sort of gentle boiling. Then it is frying. Frying here it is again a here, oil, some sorts of edible oil is used for heat transfer medium, and the temperature is much above, above 100 degrees Celsius. But at the same time, this oil, which is used for the frying, it also, there is oil absorption in the food, and it improves the eating qualities, exactly, the, of the food. You can see that even take the example of uh, chapati, it's paratha, and puri. So then how, that is one is the, no uh, oil is used, just simple uh, baking. Then in the other case, you are, that fat or oil is smeared, and then it is baked. And then there, there is a deep fat, deep fat frying, where puri, etc. And they are in the 
significant difference in the not only taste of all these products but also in the texture and other eating quality sensory qualities etc so this is all about the cooking in brief okay then we come to the blanching blanching it is the a very important uh, commercial process that is it is a basically a pre treatment most of the canning industries drying industries as well as freezing industries they use it before their actual processing all right so the plant tissues or animal tissues prior to their freezing drying or canning they are exposed to a mild heat treatment and this mild heat treatment applied to tissues system prior to freezing drying or blanching or canning is known as blanching so objective of this process depends upon the process to follow that is for what it is being which process it is being used as a uh, pre treatment for example blanching prior to freezing or drying main purpose is inactivation of enzymes enzymes like parax all most all the enzymes parax so that there it doesn't support the growth of uh, browning reactions because most of the plant food they have the enzymes like polyphenolases poly polyphenol oxidases etc okay so they cause enzymatic browning like you see that in the fruits when you dry the fruit even potato chips etc all this when they are uh, <clears throat> make if their enzymes are not taken care of so when the heat is they are given or when the potato is peeled when apple is peeled then these materials they contain certain enzymes as i told you polyphenolases or polyphenol oxidases and also they have the substrate in it polyphenols so these enzymes work on these substrates and enzymatic oxidation takes place and brown color com compounds are formed certain that melanin etc are formed and which gives the uh, that's what you i am sure that you must have observed the surface dark darkening of the peeled potato surface darkening of the peeled apples if you peel banana and keep at room temperature after some time its surface will become dark brown or black so that is basically these are the enzymatic browning okay there are certain enzymes which even after freezing in the case of beans etc pea and many other materials that if the enzymes are not taken inactivated so in the frozen food when their foods are frozen these enzymes they become active at the, such a sub zero temperature and then they may cause some sort of they may be involved in some certain changes in the textural changes recrystallization etc or some other components because they give it so that ultimately influences the final quality of the product so it becomes very important that these enzymes be inactivated before this plant tissue is dried before the potato chips is made that this uh, chips will be this uh, potato should be enzyme should be inactivated polyphenolases polyphenol oxidases etc should be inactivated so that the quality of the dried potato dried fruit dried vegetable okay is intact uh, good good quality so there is a of course certain this plant system they may have large number of enzymes present in that so among the those enzymes which are present in the most of the tissue system the peroxidases and catalases are considered to be are known to be the most heat resistant enzyme so the blanching processes are optimized that is it is performed the heat treatment which is sufficient to kill the peroxidases and catalases all right that is given so or uh, how to do that is it is the same similar like uh, we will see little later about the microorganism so similarly in the case of here peroxidases etc there is the uh, time temperature that is the tissue in the 
the particular form either in the uh, before pulling it the thin uh, form thin slices or in the whole fruit or in the juice or the case may be all right it is exposed to heat calculate to give calculated amount of energy that type a particular time temperature combination so that it uh, inactivate removes peroxidase and catalase and since these peroxidase and catalase are most heat resistant so obviously when these are inactivated all other enzymes polyphenolase etc polyphenol oxidase etc that will definitely be uh, oxidized that will sorry inactivated so food will become become safe so that is the purpose here all right then uh, blanching prior to canning fulfills several important objectives and a few of them that is number one removal of tissue gases and cleansing the tissue which helps in maintaining high can vacuum okay that is one uh, uh, let me explain that in the traditional canning which we will study little later that is what is done the food is prepared and it is either in the form of slices or in the form of cubes or whatever form it is peeled and all those things it is kept in the can are like sometime even pea etc they are put as such and then some syrup sugar syrup uh, salt syrup brine solution etc is filled into it and then <coughs> can is evacuated and sealed so inside the can after it is sealed there is a inside there is a uh, this uh, vacuum no air it is because and then uh, then the can is heated okay it is given the calculated heat for time it is either put in the retort or put in some uh, other method other heating chambers etc all right where in oven or in any other heating facility okay that where it is exposed to a particular time temperature that is the temperature and for a particular time right so Uh, the most of the heat processes thermal processing canning etc they are calculated on the basis of vacuum inside it and i am sure you are aware that the heat transfer in an environment of air and heat transfer in a uh, vacuum there is a different so the if the air inside that is if the tissue during blanching when they are blanched some heat treatment is given so this blanching it also it helps removal of the tissue gases the gases which are entrapped inside the cellular matrix during blanching when you give the heat treatment then cells get uh, maybe get ruptured cell wall get up and these gases may go out so that is one so it helps in maintaining otherwise if it was not tissue gases may disturb the vacuum inside the can and also that is so it cleans the tissue it reduces the bulk of the tissue and which helps are facilitates in the packaging so in the same amount of in the same container if there is a blanched tissue and if there is unblanched tissue so blanched tissue more amount of blanched tissue blanched fruit can be packed in the same container because its volume has reduced it has reduced volume okay another very important uh, objective is fulfilled is that is the increasing the temperature of the tissues increasing the temperature of the tissue means that is you see at least blanching is given around 80 degree celsius or 80 85 degree celsius for me means that is the blanching uh, by this way when you are blanching the fruit tissue its temperature is brought to at least 80 degree and then when it is put in by the can and can is sealed and after that can is heated so now uh, suppose there was no blanching so material tissue was at room temperature it has been kept in the container and the other in other container the temperature of the material which is being filled is 80 degree celsius so you can see the difference how much because the can is finally suppose it is heated at boiled at 100 degree celsius so energy required in initial come up time initial time that is one case where is the from 25 to 
and other gas, 80 to 100. So it makes a lot of difference that the energy saving, economy of operation, etc. Then at least there are a few examples where the blanching prior to caning fulfills the purpose of activation of enzymes, particularly in the certain beans, etc. It uh, is done to activate the enzyme pectin methyl esterase enzyme. Pectin methyl esterase, what it does in the beans, that is the, if you see that if you break open the beans, the find that the seeds of the bean, they are attached with the epidermis or central core, but this attachment is very uh, tender. So during the processing, it was in where it is. It was seen. It was found that these beans get split open, and the seeds get loosened because they are loosely added into the dermis. The dermis is loose. Then seeds get loosened, and they get spilled inside the can. That defect is known as slouching. So when it is uh, heated before, then pectin methyl esterase enzymes becomes active. And this pectin methyl esterase, what it does? It demethylates pectin. Pectin is a polysaccharide and which is a structural component. So it is involved in that structure of that beans, etc. So when it and it, it is a methylated. So when it is demethylated, means there is a uh, pectin after it is demethylated, then the position from where the methyl group is removed it uh, comes and calcium, it acts with the calcium. So this, uh, after demethylation, pectin forms calcium pectinate because calcium is also present inside the seed, inside the bean. So it forms calcium pectinate and calcium pectinates make the joint or seed where it are missed much strong, little stronger. So it's uh, during that uh, heating, that opening of the, Bean and splitting of the bean, etc., is prevented. So that defect is called slouching, and slouching is prevented by activation, so by blanching. So these are the objectives of blanching prior to canning as well as prior to drying or freezing. Okay. And the methods for the blanching, obviously, it may be hot water, that is, you have to either, as the case may be, it may be uh, dipped. In hot water, it may be low LTLT method, low temperature, long time, it may be high temperature, short time, either by direct dipping in the hot water, at a boiling water, or at a water bath, water is maintained, can be maintained at a particular temperature, and then the material may be suitably packaged, etc. And package it may be dipped, or the EC steam, it may be steam blanching, in the pressure blanching, or even open atmospheric steam blanching. Steam may be just sprayed over the material sector. So there it can be different forms can be used. Similarly, high pressure blanching also or microwave oven like we have. So microwave in the microwave oven, the material can be kept for a few seconds, etc. Or irradiation, ionizing, ionizing radiations, etc. can be used. So means in some form or one form or the other form, either heat energy or even alternate heating method, or even non-heating method like ionizing radiation energy, etc., is given to inactivate the enzyme or to rupture the tissues to facilitate packaging, etc., before canning or whatever is the objective of the process. This is brief about the blanching. Does anyone have any, any query about blanching? Or cooking or blanching so far we discussed any observation, any comment, any question? No? Okay, no question, we'll proceed further. The pasteurization, all right, then these are the two important uh, methods now we are coming from the preservation point of view of the food, processing point of view, that is which are again commercially used thermal processes in many food by the industry. One is the pasteurization, 
and another is the sterilization. Okay, pasteurization is a very popular method in the dairy industry or even wine industry. Any liquid food is a term mostly. They are pasteurized. Milk is pasteurized before it is sent to home, even market milk, etc. Okay, so what is the purpose of the pasteurization? That is, it kills a part but not all vegetative cells present in the food. Vegetative cells are, in other words, you can say, Pathogenic microorganisms. So the pasteurization, purpose of pasteurization is to kill the pathogenic microorganism from the food. So food becomes that uh, disease free. That is, if you, the pasteurized foods, at least they will be disease free. They will not support the growth of the disease producing or pathogenic microorganism. However, since Pasteurization does not, uh, it is not, uh, all microorganisms are not killed, are not removed. So some non-pathogenic or spoilage causing microorganism will be there. So therefore, to have little higher self life, the pasteurizes, pasteurized foods, some other the methods are used like refrigeration, irradiation, chemical additive, etc. like pasteurized foods, that is pasteurized milk which you are getting, you use, it is advisable to keep them inside the refrigerator, not in the open atmosphere. If you want to have at least some days, one week or so self life, otherwise, you can, the other microorganism will spoil the food. Although it will be disease free, but similarly, irradiation, chemical addition, addition of chemicals, even irradiation. So these pasteurized foods, pasteurization is generally always used in, along with together with some other is to preservation method if one wants little prolonged self life or prolonged preservation value okay so as i told you in most of the cases it is used to or in many cases we used to destroy pathogenic microorganism so the time temperature treatment all right there is a pasteurization process again depends upon the nature of the food and the heat resistant of the pathogenic microorganism or vegetative cells that is whatever the depending upon the pH of the food, correct uh, nutrients which are available in the food, some microorganisms, it may support some growth of some microorganism, it may not support growth of other microorganisms. So whatever possible microorganism that can be able to, that can grow in that particular food, so among them, which are, are the pathogenic. So among the pathogenic microorganism, it is found which one is the most heat resistant. So like in the case of blanching, we saw that is peroxidases and catalases are the most heat resistant enzymes. So their inactivation is targeted. Similarly here, one need to find what is the most heat resistant pathogenic microorganism in case of pasteurization. And that is targeted. And of course, that is uh, while heating the food for killing the path, most resistant pathogenic microorganism, the care should be taken. That is, what is the how, what are the other nutrients, nutrients, quality factors in the food, how they are sensitive to heat. Because otherwise, you may, uh, if uh, you adopt a process which kills, removes all pathogenic microorganism at the same time. Also, it destroys all the nutritional value or eatability of the food, eating quality of the food. So that purpose, that's totally defeats the purpose and that preservation has no, no meaning, no value. So the, uh, this uh, time temperature combination should be accordingly taken care of. So in the milk, if you take the example earlier, that is it is the mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the TB farming bacteria, bacteria which causes TB. And it's uh, commonly found in the milk and milk is if you like the conditions in the, which are there in the dairy farm, etc. So it is it was assumed or rather found that the milk normally produced, it is contaminated with the TB producing bacteria, Coxilla barnetii, eh, sorry. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So traditionally, the milk was pasteurized on the basis of killing of the mycobacterium tuberculosis, TB bacteria. 
and for that the conditions were high temperature start time means 71.6 degrees celsius for 15 seconds or ltlt 62.8 degrees celsius for 30 minutes okay but now it is found that this coxella barnetti one is that this is a rickettsia organism high q fever organism so q fever organism and that has a similar almost similar contamination level to that of the uh, uh, that is mycobacterium tuberculosis in the milk but it has a higher resistance higher resistance than the mycobacterium tuberculosis so now the market milk that pasteurization conditions are based on the inactivation of coxilla burnetii and once coxilla burnetii is it means mycobacterium tuberculosis will already be taken care of so high acid fruits like cherry etc as you have seen that in the case of acidity that is these pathogenic bacteria etc or spirulent bacteria will not be able to grow in those high acidity so there the pasteurization of these high acid juices citrus juices cherry and all these things it is the yeasts and molds there in the fermented beverages like wine beer etc they are pasteurization condition in the wild yeast there is wild yeast there are certain yeasts which can grow into the uh, juice fruit juice and produce by products or products other than the alcohol it is the alcoholic producing yeast is saccharomyces cerevisiae so that is called saccharomyces cerevisiae is called wine yeast or bread yeast but there are certain wild yeast, undesirable yeast, which may ferment and make the uh, sugar, uh, make the juice spoil. So these wild yeasts are targeted in the pasteurization. Pasteurization condition is made in such a way that these wild yeasts are eliminated. Okay. So that is brief about the pasteurization. Now we'll come to the sterilization. Okay, sterilization, it is a, a sterile product is free from any viable microorganism. That is, if you say that this food is sterilized means that it will not support the growth, that doesn't contain any uh, uh, microorganism or viable microorganism means vi viable means which is able to grow which is able to grow and multiply, that should not. So it should be free from any form of microorganism. So you know that the temperature slightly above, the maximum for bacterial growth results in the death of the vegetative cell. Suppose if a bacteria needs a maximum 40 degree for its growth, then if you increase the temperature 40, above 40, 50 degree or more than that, the, it will cause bacteria will be dead, die. So temperature slightly above the maximum for that growth of the microorganism results into its death. And it basically that uh, either denaturation of the protein, that uh, destruction of the protein, because most of these uh, microorganisms sector, they have that their protein system gets denatured and their growth activity ceases. Okay, so that death occurs. Bacterial spores which are more resistant to vegetative cells are of primary concern in most of the sterilization processes. In the last class, earlier class, we discussed that is how the spores are, they have more because during the sporulation process, they have more and more uptake of calcium ion and the formation of dipicolonic acids. So because of their these reasons, spores are more resistance. And in fact, most of the dairy industry, food industry, low acid, uh, low acid food processing industry, they are majority of the pathogenic bacteria are spore farmers. They are able to farm spore. So, and spores, they have more heat resistant than their vegetative cells. So obviously, the thermal process conditions are uh, optimized. Or it, should, it is generally calculations are based on the removal of or destruction of spore of that particular bacteria. Okay. Then another very, very important uh, term here is the commercial sterilization. Let me say that in the food industry, what we do, we do commercial sterilization, not the 
general sterilization because sterilization when we give a heat the heat will see maybe little later sometime that that the destruction of the microorganism like growth is a logarithmic similarly destruction of the microorganism death of the microorganism is also a logarithmic if you put the log uh, number of survivors and uh, the time you will get a straight line and this straight line will never touch the x axis means theoretically one can never get a zero microorganisms in the so for the process calculation what is done that it is a some assumption is made that either we go for a how many log cycle depending upon the type of microorganisms involved type of food and other conditions okay that is we pre decide that is whether we want to go for a 12 log cycle reduction or 8 log cycle reduction or 5 log cycle reduction etc means there is 12 log cycle reduction if you are going so if there are initially 10 to the power 12 microorganism so at least after the process one microorganism will be remaining there and that one microorganism will grow and multiply and will produce toxin so that here yeah, so it, it is the criteria it will be there so maybe so in the commercial sterilization then what we do that we normally take care of also there are certain microorganisms which may be pathogenic but which are even like thermophilic thermophilic bacteria they require a temperature of 55 degree celsius or so for their growth and they are toxin producing but that is means when they grow then only they will produce toxin but these uh, clostridium botulinum bacillus stearo thermophilus etc so these bacteria when they they will be problematic only when they grow but they have uh, 20 times or much higher resistance than that of the clostridium botulinum it is the clostridium botulinum is generally used to uh, optimize the conditions of processing conditions of the low acid food okay so that is uh, this high heat resistant thermophilic microorganism but ignored here ignored means they might be present but they will not be they are taken care of that is their post processing the conditions are managed in such a way that they do not grow and multiply so means the commercial sterilization means in commercially sterile food there may be some microorganisms present but the post sterilization the conditions are maintained in such a way that these uh, uh, microorganisms which survive the process they are not able to grow and multiply so the criteria of success of the sterilization process the commercial sterilization is the inability of the microorganisms and their spores to grow under conditions normally encountered during storage okay they told you there could be some non pathogenic microorganism in the food but the environmental condition non pathogenic microorganisms like bacillus stearo thermophilus clostridium botulinum or the other microorganism okay so the environmental conditions are maintained in such a way that the organism do not reproduce do not grow do not spoil the food foods processed with such a criteria or commercially sterile or bacterially inactive or partially sterile so you can say that they are bacterially inactive food commercially sterile food that is the term commercial sterilization is used okay so thermal process thermal conditions required to produce commercial sterility depends upon the nature of the food that is particularly the ph storage conditions following the thermal process heat resistance of the microorganisms or its spore heat transfer characteristics of the food its container container in which the food is packed and then heated and the heating medium inside what is the heating medium okay initial load of the microorganisms 
uh, that is why here initial load that yes in the production point it is said that the clean and hygienic conditions should be maintained otherwise if they so that the initial contamination level is minimum minimum is the initial contamination minimum will be the energy required to produce the desired commercial sterility okay. higher the initial load higher will be the energy required to produce commercial sterility nature of the food ph will decide that what is the type of microorganism which will grow which will not grow and so things okay so the commercially sterile products are generally presented in hermetically sealed container to prevent recontamination obligate aerobes are unable to grow that in hermetically sealed container they are there you can see the kind kind rasgulla is there kind pineapple kind peas etc so in that that there is a, as i told you there is a anaerobic environment so obviously the obligate aerobes that is those microorganism those bacteria which are strict aerobes obligate aerobes means they will not be inside the condition does not favor their growth they require oxygen for their growth so obviously they will not be able to grow spores of obligate aerobes are less heat resistant than those of obligate or facultative anaerobes so obviously when the facultative or strict anaerobes spores are taken we are most of the our process thermal process is based on the destruction of spores of obligate anaerobes or facultative anaerobes obligate anaerobes all right so obviously from the, when they are is killed then spores of obligate aerobes will also be killed so they also they are having less heat resistance then food for process based on the inactivation of facultative or obligate aerobes ph of the food that will be the critical factors there are some extremely heat resistant spores that might survive a commercial process but due to low ph of the food they do not germinate or they do not create a problem okay, they may survive the process but they may not create the problem they may not be able to grow so for the thermal process design foods are classified into three major groups high acid foods that is which has ph less than 3.7 and more like sauerkraut pineapple apple grapefruit pickles lemons etc they may cause an apple means some variety of apple raw apple particularly acid foods like uh, ph they have in between 3.7 to 4.5 the tomato pears peaches oranges apricots the low acid food which has a ph more than 4.5 like milk corn wheat carrot potatoes spices rice olives chicken beef fish egg so whatever the majority of the food that we eat really that is even grains etc they have they, they have the ph that they are in the low acid range low acid ph and ph more than 4.5 so now these on the basis of the ph the heat process is decided like the heat process for acid foods acid foods like which has ph more than 3.7 sorry uh, ph less than 3.7 okay so acid foods their inactivation of yeast and molds or spore farming bacteria do not grow at a ph less than 3.7 okay so spore farming bacteria do not grow so obviously the yeast and molds So you have seen in the even like in the pasteurization. Similarly, here for sterilization also, for sterilization of acid foods, or you can say high acid food, that <coughs> that the yeast and mold is targeted. The pH 4.5, which we are dividing between acid and low acid food, it is slightly lower than the pH at which Clostridium botulinum is spores. can grow and produce toxic means that is in uh, low acid food which has a ph 4.5 or lower or higher that in this the clostridium botulinum spores grow will grow and it will multiply and it will produce toxic clostridium botulinum is the most heat resistant obligate aerobe sir obligate anaerobe that it can uh, 
the conditions inside the cone, aerobic anaerobic condition favors its its growth. It is a spore farming pathogenic bacteria and which can grow in low acid kind of foods. Therefore, destruction of Clostridium botulinum is used as a criteria for successful heat processing of low acid foods. Most heat resistant strains of Clostridium botulinum are those that are type A and B. There are many strains of Clostridium botulinum, but type A and B are the most heat resistant. And mandate, they told you that the, this Clostridium botulinum, it produces a toxin which is extremely potent, okay? But it can be destroyed, destroyed by exposing the toxin to moist heat for about 10 minutes, maybe 10 minutes at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is about the low acid food thermal passing conditions, but <coughs> the, for, the PA3679, it is a putrefactive anaerobe, putrefactive anaerobe 3675. Okay. It is a non-toxic obligate anaerobe. It is a mesophile, a spore farming bacteria, and it has a little more heat resistance than the Clostridium botulinum. Okay. So this PA3675 is used to judge the process adequacy. So to have a, a safe thermal process to know that the other the thermal processing conditions calculated time temperature conditions which had been given to the food whether it is adequate or not so this uh, PA3675 is used that uh, the process heated food it's just uh, analyzed evaluated for presence of PA3675 and the process must uh, be able to uh, complete uh, destroy that if you, the process it doesn't show any presence of PA3675 does it mean that yes the process which has been given to the low acid food is good and it <coughs> is safe okay and there, as I told you in the commercial sterilization earlier little little ago that the low acid foods Processing could also be based on inactivation of spores, which are which are which have more heat resistant than that of the Clostridium botulinum, and these spores do exist in the food, like Bacillus stereothermophilus, which is also known as FS1518, or Clostridium thermosaccharolyticum. So these spore farming bacteria, they are also facultative and aerobic. But their spores are 20 times more heat resistant than those of the Clostridia botulinum. But still, they are ignored during thermal process calculations of low acid food. And the major reason is that these are thermophiles. These Bacillus stereothermophilus and Clostridia thermosaccharolyticum, they are thermophilic bacteria. Their optimum growth temperature is between 20, 49 to 55 degrees Celsius. That is, most of these do not grow at a temperature below 40 degree or below 38 degree to be very precise. Okay. So, these are ignored. They can be ignored in the thermal processing of low acid food provided. And that is why even most of the sterilization process of low acid food, you see that after the heating and regeneration, section if you see that sterilization plant of milk all right milk sterilization plant or any low acid sterilization plant there is a heating section regeneration means that is the material is heated to the desired temperature and in the regeneration it is hold, held up for that duration period of time and then it is sent to the cooling section and the <coughs> material after heating it should be quickly cooled that is very very important that is quickly Cool to below 40 degrees Celsius or below 38 degrees Celsius to be more precisely. And what is the main reason? Because if it is uh, not quickly cooled, the material is already having more thermophilic and you have heated it uh, at 100 degrees or so. So if during the cooling process, if you use slow cooling, so if the material is exposed for a longer period, maybe more than half an hour or so, at a temperature range of 49 to 55 degrees Celsius, okay, then these 
microorganism may grow in it and whole purpose of your sterilization will be defeated. Okay, so that is for that reason, it is a very important thing that the material should be quickly cooled heat after heating. Low acid food should be quickly cooled and it's brought down to below 40 degrees Celsius so that <laughs> the thermophilic microorganisms are not, or even during uh, storage, etc., of these foods, commercially sterile, low acid foods, they should always be stored below 38 degrees Celsius or 35 degrees Celsius to be more safe. Okay, so below 38 degrees Celsius. Okay. Thermal process conditions for acid foods are generally based on the facultative anaerobes like bacillus coagulans, bacillus thermoacidurans, bacillus macerans, or bacillus polymexa. These are the microorganisms of concern in the acid food. So you have seen high acid food, uh, mold and yeast, low acid food, Clostridium botulinum. Okay, and acid food, that is bacillus coagulans, bacillus macerans, and bacillus polymixa. And most of these obligate anaerobes, causing a spoilage of acid food, have less heat resistance than the bacillus organisms. Okay, so if these bacillus organisms are taken care of, then most of the other obligate anaerobes will already be taken care of. So for tomato and tomato products generally, for tomato puri, tomato ketchup sauce, destruction of bacillus coagulans is the basis of thermal process. Bacillus coagulans destruction is used for the commercial sterilization of tomato products. Okay, so here it is a summary of the bacteria important in spoilage of kind of food, okay? Like approximate temperature, if you see that thermophilic, mesophilic, and psychotropic or psychrophilic, there is the thermophilic, 35 to 45, above 35, or in general, 40 to 45, you can, 55, you can say, to be further optimum is 49 to 55. So, okay, these are in the acid food, it is bacillus coagulans, and low acid food, it is Clostridium thermosacrolyticum, Clostridium nigrificans, and Bacillus stereo thermophilus. So these are the thermophiles. So they should be the, normally in the acid food receptor. If the conditions post process is maintained below this, to be more safe, I told that before, if they are stored below 35, so these thermophiles will not grow. So even they are present, there's no problem. Mesophilic. In the acid food, the important bacteria is Clostridium brutalicum, Clostridium bacillus, bacillus macerans, and bacillus polymixa. And in the low acid food, it is Clostridium botulinum by A and B, Clostridium sporogenes, sporogenes, bacillus lecithiformis, and bacillus septis. Psychotropic, it is the Clostridium botulinum type E, that is which can manage to grow in a low temperature conditions, or refrigerator, or etc. So they are the important, they become the important bacteria for concentration. So this is briefly about the thermal process principles, etc. Okay. Is it okay? Anyone? Uh, there is the principles of thermal process. Anyone, any query, question? Yes. Sumit Mahesh Karwa. Taptaswa Maiti. Neil Pratap Songa. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have any question? <coughs> no. Could you understood everything? Yes, her Sasi. All right. That Neil Pratap Songa. Can you can you just little bit uh, summarize what do you mean by commercial sterilization? Uh, I mean, 
they are uh, generally presented in a hermetically sealed containers okay. to prevent recontamination okay i think not uh, will anyone say ritvik ritvik dandari ritvik now so today avilas mukherjee is not there that is mukherjee uh, ritvik can you can you elaborate commercial sterilization yes sir it is the like uh, achieving conditions of uh, for not uh, the kind of the creating conditions for uh, like minimum growth or not grow like not growing of uh, bacterial spores or uh, food spoilage bacteria yes i think that commercially sterile food it may contain you are rightly told it may contain certain microorganism particularly thermophilic etc alright but the conditions of the food in which it is kept post harvest a uh, post process sorry post process it may not encourage it may not allow the growth of that so it is a bacterially inactive food bacteria may be present but the bacteria is not active it cannot grow and multiply that is the commercial sterilization all right sir i has doubt in this yes please uh, please uh, what is the meaning of hermetically sealed hermetically sealed means that is yes uh, it is uh, sealed in such a way hermetic sealing means uh, air tight it is made air tight and inside there is a vacuum that is anaerobic condition okay sir all right hermetically yes, air tight and inside there is a uh, anaerobic environment that is called hermetic sealing yes sir god Abhilash Mukherjee, today is not there. Raghu Sharma, hello. Yes, Raghu sir. Raghu Sharma. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why, why this uh, after commercial sterilization, low acid food should be quickly cooled? They told me they should be quickly cooled and they should be brought down below thirty-five degrees Celsius. Why? I do really know this answer. Ambika, hello, Ambika. Hello. Yes, Ambika. Yes, I can hear you. Tell, please. Can can you speak? Can you tell the question? Did you listen the question? What happened? She has left the meeting. Some connection problem, network problem. Okay. Jay Sunia, Jay Swayna, MJ, Jay Swayna, MJ. Hello, Jay Swayna, MJ. जय चंद्र रमेश को जय चंद्र रमेश हेलो रमेश एनीवे आई थिंक इफ देयर इज नो क्वेरी आई आई विल मूव टू द नेक्स्ट चैप्टर हेलो सर हां जी यस अंबिका Uh, sir my name is sanjeevni sir i wanted to ask one thing uh, okay. sir we talked that uh, botulinum is the most heat resistant and then there was a statement that pa3675 is also is most more uh, heat resistant than botulinum sir yes, then in what context did we state right. that botulinum yes. is most heat resistant right right so you see that among the poisonous All right, toxin producing microorganisms. Botulinum, botulinum clostridium, botulinum is the one. 
all right so your that whole process is calculated and it is based upon at least the calculation which is done it should be such that your heat process must be able to completely eliminate the clastridium botulinum because it is a toxin producing and it is anaerobic and it can grow inside that all right but many a times after the process is when we are there in the process optimization in r and d and all those things then we need to you have there are certain methods for which following which you can calculate the what are the conditions and what will be under the given condition inside the can this will be the time temperature combination if you give like 12 day process 8 day process maybe at 121 degree celsius for 2 minutes 2.5 minutes or 3 minutes okay which is 121 degree celsius for 3 minutes is considered known as botulinum cook that is in, it has been since long being followed in the industry for the low acid food means uh, the clustering if you uh, accurately calculate the time temperature requirement means it will come at 121 degree celsius 2.52 minutes but industry uses 3 minutes at 121 degree celsius okay so because one now the pa3675 which i told it is having favorably are reasonably more resistance than the thermal resistance than the clastridium botulinum but it is a non toxic so when we are making assay that is post heat treatment when we are analyzing so it is easier it is advisable to test the food for the survival of the pa3675 rather than the clastridium botulinum because clastridium botulinum is a toxin producing and it is no one should take that risk sometime even sensory uh, uh, things may be there are even the microbiological obviously first we go for the microbiological methods and then so to judge the adequacy of the process that whether uh, it is a sufficient enough the process which you have given is sufficient enough to kill all the pathogenic microorganisms or not processed food is evaluated evaluated for the presence of pa3675 because it is a non toxic so it is evaluation study on this is little easier okay so if your food it is uh, safe from the pa3675 you find that all the pa3675 has been taken care of so obviously since it has higher resistance than the clastridium botulinum so almost all the toxin producing or pathogenic microorganism must have been and will be taken care of is it clear now yes sir yes sir it is clear okay ajay saptaswa maiti तुम्हारी बिल्ली भी देख रही है फोटो में लुक रही दिख रही है यू हैव इन इन योर योर फिगर वी सी देयर देयर इज अ वेरी नाइस कैट हैंड्स राइट यस यस सर 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 इट वाज माय फर्स्ट फर्स्ट ईयर ईयर इन द any should we move ahead or any question you have no sir it's fine okay. with me you can and, move ahead okay all right so let's and next friday i think uh, we professor tkg will take and after that when we meet there will be class tests this is all for information to you all anyway so now go ahead to the next topic that is the technology of commercial sterilization we have studied the principles heat process different heat processes how the processes are used what are the basics at least i have given 
and i am sure you are being taught in the food uh, engineering in the food engineering further commercialization and all those things engineering details and process calculations and all those things i am sure you will be definitely taught there so now i will focus on that uh, technology how this actually what is the method of heating the food method of particularly commercial sterilization of the technology of commercial sterilization of the food and there are basically two approach two approaches a two basic method that are used to obtain commercial sterility in food to make sure that the food is bacterially inactive so that it has a comparatively longer shelf life okay. there is one is the heating of the food after it has been placed in the container and which is nothing but this is the called as a conventional canning method and in principle it is the same method that was used by french chemist nicolas apart who invented canning this nicolas apart is canning is accordingly also known as apartization apart is known as father of canning okay and he for the first time sealed the water hermetically sealed then he heated the water took the turned in a hermetically sealed container heated it boiled it for some time and found that yes this water it will it did not support the growth of microorganism and from where these things came out further so that is the traditional means the food is it has been placed in the container and then it is heated but the second approach of course that is the in this uh, that when the food is packed inside the heat and then uh, sorry in the container maybe metal container or glass container something so there is a certain uh, limitations also now uh, once it is uh, established heat processes are taught that heat penetration characteristics and maybe that uh, inside the you have to invariably one has to give more heat and these heats high heat is given high energy uh, is required to get the desired sterilization value because there are many other factors involved there heat transfer medium inside the container food characteristics type of the container heat transfer characteristics of the container material of construction of container etc so all these factors invariably they uh, cause the more heat input and these more heat input required to get the desired commercial sterility is also accordingly it results in the nutrient destruction and the, the second thing that in the conventional canning the manufacturer does not have much options like there are traditional cans traditional glass bottles all right now in many industries still they are being followed like uh, the uh, cold drinks if you see that uh, they are the traditional bottling or even traditional kind of pee kind of rasgulla many products kind of pineapple slices etc fruit slices are available so these are the things but in this there were certain as i told you that there were the problem that in this uh, energy much energy was there nutrient destruction was a problem and not much flexibility as available was available with the producer to have the product of attract in attractive package design and which can could that uh, attract the consumers and all those things so this has all led to the another method which is now which has become now more and more popular uh, that is known as aseptic processing and packaging okay so that in what is done in aseptic processing and packaging heating and cooling the food that the food is heated without packing it it is heated and cooled and then packaging material is heated or it is separately sterilized and then it is packed in a aseptic environment so since here the, there is not much the container is not the heat transfer heat transfer maybe many a times it is fast and the heating and sterilization value by just giving less uh heat energy you can get a desired sterilization so it invariably results in economical 
packaging alternatives it results in energy saving it results in improved product quality and more importantly that i will see that it is that normally the ffs machines are used okay see in the in the aseptic processing and packaging that is basically here the product is sterilized there is a sterilization line for the product there is a sterilization line for the container and then this product can directly it is sterilized and then container material packaging material etc flexible packages generally used they are sterilized and then there is a farm fill and seal machine so you see most of this tetra pack and all those things which you are getting seeing in the market they are all produced in the, the fruit juice comes through the pipes in this light the packaging material there is a rolls of the uh, laminates etc they are already sterilized rolls and there is a environment here completely clean environment aseptic environment where this uh, it is filled and the material uh, is just uh, heated uh, filled in the uh, it gives a uh, to manufacturer various option that they can develop that the uh, packaging of different size different shapes different geometry etc there are ffs machine which can produce uh, packets of uh, 25 kg or 5 kg or 1 kg 500 ml 200 ml it can ffs machine farm fill and steel machines are available now packaging of solid foods grains liquid foods juices paste etc and in fact in india in our country there is there has been a tremendous there is a, we are now very good uh, ffs making ffs making companies okay who can which are making good quality ffs machines ffs packaging machines okay so that is the call the commercial uh, that aseptic process so i will just give so before i come to the commercial sterilization as that like aseptic processing and packaging less briefly the typical cleaning operations as you see here it is a uh, sequential process what is done in the traditional cleaning traditional typical conventional cleaning process the raw material is obtained raw material preparation may be depending upon the type of the raw material fruit vegetable other thing it is obvious the cleaning sorting grading then sometime uh, uh, slicing or even juicing whatever is made that whether you want to can it in the form of a a slice in the form of a whole fruit or in the form of a cube or in the form of a pulp or in the form of a juice whatever method you want to cut so accordingly it has to be prepared and then blanching we already studied the blanching depending upon the again type of the in the form in which it is been cut the material may be before peeling or sometime after peeling sometime before slicing or after slicing it is a, a given the heat treatment to inactivate the enzymes or for other purposes like what we study the blanching melting and uh, increasing the temperature making it cleansing the tissue etc and after that by suitable method it is filled in the can and then the cans are exhausted either by the mechanical means or generally even water exhaust or steam exhaust are used used where in the in above the container the lids are placed and then lids are by using double sealing that is the leading and clinching that is the double seaming operation of the double seamer these are the loosely uh sealed loosely sealed but the design just clinching operation means that it, it is sufficient enough that it will not allow the outside air to come or or spilling the content but from inside it can uh enter the air to go out it can permit the, the air to go out so when this material contain in this they are taken on the conveyor belt and it is said the conveyor belt it is passed through 
some uh, tunnel and where the water boiling water or water is uh, at a heated water is there and this means so when this temperature is made maybe sometime it is optimized that when it enters and come out of the water tunnel the heat the temperature in the center of the can is taken at around if it is reached 80 degrees celsius it is mean that it is blanched and for 2 3 minutes so it permits all the gases which are there inside it has gone out and up, after that the second operation of the seaming it is sealed and then the sealed can now which has the material inside it is heated it is heated for calculated time cooled and finally labeled warehousing and storage so that is the these are the typical sequential operations of the canning process but here i will just like to you to little bit study that one that uh, you can take an one assignment siddhar you can give one assignment uh, all right exercise it is a one exercise all right earlier you have i hope you have already posted one exercise that what are the major microorganisms associated their physiological characteristics and growth conditions etc they are writing all right uh, not this one sir uh, huh. we will give in the second assignment and no no it's, uh, all right assignment we will be giving assignment which will be evaluated all right but this we are giving them them exercise exercises then if you have, if you have not uh, given that please give that this is the exercise request yes. that they, uh, they have to read and they have to make them acquainted they need not to submit that but they must uh, read from the literature and they prepare themselves for that all right so that was exercise one. If you have not uploaded, please upload it. And now exercise two. All right. Yes. Let them that uh, the convention steps, different steps, and methodology and uh, parameters, process parameters of the conventional canning of a fruit or vegetable. Let them take any fruit. Let them take any vegetable. All right. Or in general, bar fruits and vegetables like the pea hai, or even meat hai, or canned sweets hai. so they can take any low acid food or acid food high acid food whatever but what, uh, what i want that in the process of this exercise they must learn the typical canning process and how like exhausting i briefly told that exhausting steam exhausting or even how there are the vacuum mechanical means just by having some vacuum and remove the gas. How, what are the different methods of filling the material inside the container? Okay, then sealing, what are the different methods of heating it, conventional canning, like putting the can inside the galvanized iron tubs, or maybe again there are the heating tunnels so they can put the cans in the, uh, this, uh, Conveyor belts, where they are the belts with the moving arrangement is, is sitting inside the container and then they are passed through the heating tunnel, or even retards are there, autoclaves are there. So, different combination parameters. And then, what are the methods of cooling when it comes out of the heating chamber? Sometime in the wooden galvanized tubs, etc., are there. So, here, after the material has been put in the crates, all right, then the after it is heated, then hot water is taken out and uh, then cooled water. Cold water is just immediately plunged into that. Sometimes that cold air is used that in the, in the... So there are different methods. So I am, I want this is a exercise which they should... And after that, when it comes, that leveling, it becomes a very particularly for the canning, it is metal container, etc. So outside the cans, it should be labeled. So it uh, it is a particularly coating, some sort of or paper wrapping is done. So it provides not only the platform for printing the information about the food, but it also uh, eliminates the contact between air and the metal. Similarly, inside, 
some lacquering is there where enamel coating etc is done to prevent the direct uh, contact between acid of the food and metal of the can so these are the some things so uh, they should they must understand for the these things for the traditional canning is it clear to you all okay so this exercise please there are books there are papers etc so you do this exercise if you want to submit you can submit otherwise there is no need to submit you just but make yourself if there is any question when we are giving this exercise maybe in the next class when we come on the date of examination we can uh, have some time so on these both the exercises if you have any query we can discuss otherwise we may definitely we will put some questions in the class test in the examination from the exercises as well so that is the purpose of giving you this exercises so you should read it make yourself prepared to write or answer reply any question if it is asked from them okay so that's it this is about typical canning or conventional canning now it is the aseptic processing as i told you aseptic processing and packaging it involves separate sterilization of product and container and these are brought together in a sealed sterile environment okay so that okay all right let me go for it is yes. Okay, so there are other in the aseptic environment, and now in mostly what is seen that in most of the aseptic processes they are generally UST process, ultra high temperature, very high temperature, short time methods of a fraction of minutes, fraction of seconds, sometimes generally one hundred thirty to one hundred seventy degree Celsius temperature depending upon the product they are used. in aseptic commercial sterilization and these processes are generally referred to ust process and other important thing is that most of the ust processes because under those high temperature conditions enzyme exhibit higher heat resistance than the microorganisms so majority of the ust processes are based on destruction of enzymes rather than on the inactivation of microorganisms okay so this is a schematic representation of a aseptic processing and filling system even this is the same process which is used for making any type of this food vegetable juices etc okay so you can say that it is a uh, ice water or glycol or cooling water per dipped fruit diced fruit from the blancher etc that is you have and that and it is coming here okay so basically you are from this you are getting a fruit pulp okay or juice or even sterilizer so this is one given for the pulp so similarly one has a different arrangement for those things so these pulps etc material then it is brought through this arrangement and then the temperature the heater water system holding tube that just becomes yes and this is a filler it is a ffs machine thing where the sterilization packaging materials are there this packaging material are sterilized okay and it is a filled and sealed aseptic processing filling of fruits it is system okay so thing is that in the practice there are generally two specific field of application of aseptic packaging technologies there may be packaging of sterilized foods containing no viable microorganisms like examples are milk dairy products puddings desserts fruits and vegetable juices soups sauces and products etc with particulates like uh, products with particulates you can see that gravy that the gravy 
or vegetables, we have, it has vegetable pieces or meat pieces, etc. There are many ready to eat, ready to serve food products, etc., which are aseptically processed and packaged. So they, they are that is the there is a one type of food which does not contain any viable microorganism. But there are other type of food as well, which contain viable or beneficial microorganisms, like in the case of fermented dairy products, yogurt, curd, etc. That you get in the market, you see curd in the cup, in the flexible packets, you get the curd, you get the yogurt, etc. And they are sterilized, they are aseptically processed and packaged. So there are the, the whole products now which are in the market, aseptically processed and packaged. Of course, they may be solid, they may be liquid, they may be partially solid, paste, concentrate, juice, etc. But uh, general categorization, because the conditions of processing accordingly, aseptic processing and packaging will accordingly differ. That is whether the material inside, it is having live microorganism, our material inside it is not having any live microorganisms. Okay, so number one, first thing important is the septic processing facility design. That is the area where critical process steps are carried out. That is called a septic processing area inside the production facility. That that particular room or hall where actual finally from the separate room for primary process etc. The product may come and from other the packaging material is coming but that where, where the machine that actually packaging operation is done that is called a septic processing or a septic packaging area so critical process steps are there is activity which are is the sterilized product and container closures are exposed to the atmosphere like material and handling and conveying system product sterilization system packaging material sterilization and then finally harm fill and seal packaging. So the design must minimize the challenge to a septic processing area. That is how the flow of raw materials, flow of components, product containers, closures, in process materials, food products, etc. And even more importantly, the people who are there in the facility, who are operating the plant, this all these things would be designed to prevent contamination, that there will be complete, the facility should be able to have, or it should be designed to have a completely aseptic, zero contamination environment. So that is very, very important as far as the facility design is concerned. So next is the sterilization of the product, sterilization of the packaging, filling, etc. that we will take up in the next class here today. Okay. All right. Fine. Is it anyone? Any query? Is it fine? Utkars Gupta. Hello, Utkars Gupta. Okay, I think uh, we're not uh, we're not getting any response. So let's stop it here today. We'll now meet on fourth February. Thank you. Bye bye.